G'day everyone. Welcome to our third online series presentation for October, which of course is Safe Work Month. I'm Chris Bombalus from the Office of Industrial Relations and I'm your MC for today. I would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet today and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. I'd like to extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples watching today. I would also like to thank our Safe Work Month Short Talk sponsor, No More Pain Ergonomics. No More Pain Ergonomics is one of Australia's leading suppliers of ergonomic equipment and solutions. They work with a wide range of business customers to assist them with their ergonomic needs. No More Pain Ergonomics has an extensive range of ergonomic equipment to support any ergonomic related issue. Today's event is presented by Professor Sharon Parker who is a John Curtin Distinguished Professor in Organisational Behaviour in the Faculty of Business and Law. She is also the Director of the Centre for Transformative Work Design and is the Chief Investigator of the Mature Workers in Organisation stream of the Centre of Excellence in Population Ageing. Not only that, but she has worked as a researcher and consultant in a wide range of public and private organisations and delivered numerous keynote talks, executive education for practitioner audiences. Sharon has published high impact articles in the Harvard Business Review, The Conversation and other practitioner outlets and has contributed to various government inquiries and policy reviews. She was the lead consultant on the National Good Work Design Initiative for Safe Work Australia. I'm sure we are all ready to hear Sharon's advice on evidence-based pr practical steps to address some of the issues associated with COVID, such as isolation, work stress, the need for good organisational support and communication. This is a very fitting and topical subject for us right now. Before I welcome in Sharon, remember, if you have a question, we do have a Q&A session at the end of Sharon's presentation. Use the chat box to uh, put in your, type in your question, and we'll get to as many as we can at the end of Sharon's presentation. And of course, if you do have any technical issues, use that chat box or go to events at oir.qld.gov.au and our tech gurus will be right onto it. Welcome, Sharon, from Perth. Thank you so much, Chris. And uh, thank you, everybody, for inviting me today and for attending. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge that I am on the land of the Woodjuk people um, of the Noongar Nation here in Perth, Western Australia, and I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Look, this is a big topic that we're going to cover today. You know, what's been happening in work during COVID and what might happen into the future. Uh, so let me, uh, without further ado, um, move on. And I've now discovered that most slides are not moving forward. Here we go. We are in business. So look, first of all, what was happening in terms of people working from home? And that's going to be my focus today um, before COVID. And um, basically, not many people were working from home. Um, the Australian Bureau of Stats um, estimates about nine to 20 percent. That's actually probably more than um, um, uh, is reasonable actually because they have a sort of strange criteria and they included anyone who did any work from home, you know, even catch up work in the evening. In, the, in a nutshell, it was really pretty much the chosen few, people um, sort of a bit more privileged people um, who were able to work from home and they were usually doing it part time. Of course, then we had COVID and many, many people um, had to work from home. So one way of thinking about this is it's not so much people working from home, but people at home trying to do their work in a pandemic. So a bit less choice um, about whether you could work from home. Many people doing it, even though their work wasn't really suitable or it wasn't really their preference. Um, and less time to get organised, get set up. Other issues, of course, we're all incredibly familiar with, you know, such as having to home, home school at the same time and so on. And then, of course, we have this question, well, what about the future? What are we going to see? Um, will we see a reversion back to how it was? Will we see hybrid as the new normal? And I'll come to that at the end of the presentation. 
Um, I want to start with um, people's level of mental health. Um, because that's obviously part of what this month is all about uh, focusing on. Um, Pre-pandemic, depending on which measure you use, the estimates vary, but using this particular measure, the K-5 or the K-10, around about 13% of the Australian population experienced very high or high levels of psychological distress, the sorts of levels that you might um, expect them to benefit from clinical intervention. Um, in the early days of COVID, that figure was more like 21.9%. So almost a, a, a doubling of the number of people experienced high um, distress um, during COVID. One of the questions that I want to really address today is, was well, is this just because of the pandemic? I mean, people were, you know, uncertain and, and not able to travel and businesses were in jeopardy. Is it just the pandemic or actually is there something also about work? If we go to productivity, we asked people, um, and these, this data comes from a, a large study that we did during COVID, we actually measured people 15 times, um, so I'm very, uh, very grateful to anyone who participated in our study, starting way back in April last year and, and ending just quite recently. And we asked people, how productive do you think you are compared to normal, as in pre-COVID? And um, about one quarter of people were saying less than usual. You can also see that some people are saying more than usual and some people are saying, you know, about as productive as before. So one of the things when we talk about people's experience of work during COVID is there's a lot of variation, right? There's a lot of heterogeneity. People's experiences were very different. But there were about 25% of people who felt they were not as productive. And again, we asked this question, was it just because some people were having to work from home um, even though they shouldn't really because of the nature of the work? And was it this sort of just mismatch between working from home and the type of work? Or was it something else as well? And one of the key messages, there's two key messages that I would like um, to convey today. One of the key messages is the answer to those two questions that I've just posed is that people's work itself actually also influences the quality of their work, influences their mental health and well-being. And I'm going to unpack that um, a bit more. And the second key message related to that that I want to make during today's presentation is that we need to sort of move away from saying, should we be able to remote work or not? Or should we have flexible working? or not, I think we've gone beyond that question, to really say how do we design good work, quality work, whether it's flexible and remote or whether it's in the office. So that is the shift that I would like to encourage. So I'm going to use the framework of work design to, to make these arguments. And work design is about the content and the organising of tasks, activities, relationships and responsibilities within a job or role. Um, or a set or a group of jobs and roles. Now that's a fairly academic definition. So one of the things that we've done in our team is introduce um, the SMART model of work design. And it is a way of sort of making um, that um, academic definition a bit more practical and easy to understand. So with regard to the topic of work design, and you may be used to thinking about it in terms of psychosocial hazards, Actually, there have been many, many studies over many years looking at how core aspects of your work design influence um, important outcomes. And you can see there on the screen a list of some of those. So how much variety you have in your work, whether you've got role clarity, whether you've got control, um, if you're under emotional pressure and so on and so forth. To make sense of that, we've recently um, conducted some research to do what's called a higher order factor analysis and really just to group statistically those um, factors. And this is where the, the model comes from. I will unpack it more um, in the context of COVID. And if you've heard me talk about the smart work design model before, today I'm going to focus on how it applies to the experience of working from home uh, with COVID. So the first part of the model is stimulate. 
creating. And this is really about things like having variety in your work, using your skills, feeling you're doing something meaningful, having some complexity and some challenge. M is for mastery and mastery is basically about the fact that people want to go to work and they want to do a good job, but they can only master their work and do a good job if they know what they should be doing. So that's the role clarity element. And also if they get feedback on how they are doing. Um, and it helps, of course, also to understand how does your job fit into the bigger picture. So that's mastery. A is for agency, and that's about um, autonomy or control, the importance of having some influence over when and where you work um, and key decisions in your job. And of course, to some extent, flexible working can be about agency, you know, having more control over where you work and working from home. It wasn't necessarily during COVID, of course, because people didn't necessarily have choice, but Pre-COVID, it was usually about agency. R is for relational, and this aspect of work speaks to the fact that as human beings, we all have a fundamental need to connect with other people. Um, and we've noticed that more than ever during COVID, and I'll talk more about that later. So relational aspect of smart work is about having social contact at work, connecting with not just your colleagues, but the people who benefit from the work, the, the end users getting support um, from your peers, from your supervisor, being part of a team. These sorts of things are relational. And then I come to T and T is for tolerable. And tolerable means that all those demands that you have in your work, because in essence, work is about achieving goals. So it invariably has demands. It's pretty much the definition of work. All those demands that you do have in your work though, they need to be tolerable for you. So your workload, your pressure, your work hours, um, your, role, your role expectations, they all need to feel manageable and tolerable for you. And that's the smart work design model. And um, again, without going into detail, there is a lot of research. Um, I, uh, I reviewed um, 100 years of work design research a few years ago, and we found more than 5,000 studies showing that those aspects of smart work that I've just talked about are important for mental health, they are important for motivation and performance, and they're also important for learning and growth. But what about when we're working from home? So as I mentioned, we surveyed um, some uh, a thousand, actually it was more than a thousand, but of course, by the time people drop out over time, it was a smaller number. But we, we um, surveyed uh, at least a thousand people um, around what was their work experience? So how smart was their work during um, COVID, so when they were working from home, most people in this sample were working from home. And then we statistically link that with their scores on mental health and wellbeing measures and also their scores on performance. Now, this is a big figure and I'm going to unpack it as we go through. What I wanted to show you with this big figure is that, whoops, I've gone the wrong way, uh, sorry about that, is that all of those aspects of SMART that I talked about are important, um, and here the, the darker shading means a stronger relationship. All of those aspects of, of work are important for at least some of these aspects of, of mental health and well-being and job performance. So just as an example, if we look at this burnout column, we can see that the more stimulating your work, the less the burnout, the more mastery, the less the burnout, the more agency, the less the burnout. So those negative um, scores mean that relationship is reversed. The more relational aspects in your work, the less the burnout. But here, the more you've got these things like workload and work family conflict, the more burnout there is in your work. So I want to unpack this some more. Um, so let's start with stimulating. So when people were working at home, how stimulating was their work? Um, and we found that actually quite a few people, about 30%, really were reporting that their work at home was not very stimulating, not feeling very much variety in their work, and some people really just feeling they didn't have enough to do. Um, and um, 
that actually has consequences for people's performance, right? Um, I showed you correlations before, but here I'm showing you something different. What I'm showing you is I mentioned that our study looked at, um, we measured people 15 times. Actually, this I think is, is just five waves of that data. And we asked the question, how does people's psychological distress um, shift over that time? And you can see that there are two groups in our data. There's this green group who started with lower psychological distress than the, the, the red group. And basically their psychological distress um, reduced or they got more mentally healthy over time. And that's a sort of adaption effect, okay? So to begin with, it was all a bit uncertain and new and confusing and scary, but over time you sort of adapt and things settle down. And that was one group of people, that was about 80% of the people in the sample. But for 20% of the people in the sample, we saw a different pattern and we saw these people starting with higher levels of distress. You can see they start at time one high and you can see that the levels of distress actually get higher over time. They sort of then plateau, um, but at a high level. Um, and then we asked the question, okay, well, what, which, which sorts of people are in these two groups? Um, and one of the things we found is that people who were underloaded, who lacked stimulation in their job, were in this top group. They became more distressed over time. Um, and I'll, I'm going to give some more results on this same figure later as I go through the other aspects of the SMART model. But just in terms of underload, it's important, right, because I think we have this... We have this perception that, oh, if people don't have enough to do, they'll be actually happy, you know, they'll be out playing golf and all that sort of stuff. But the reality is if people don't have enough to do, it's actually quite um, confronting and distressing um, and, you know, reducing of the motivation and meaning in their work. So what do we do about that? Well, um, for each of the aspects of SMART, I'll share a few um, tips. So if your work was not very stimulating at um, home, you know, what is it that you can do as an individual to craft um, and um, change your job to make it more stimulating. So just as an example, I have a picture there of my um, PA and her job became less stimulating during COVID because when she was working from home, she couldn't do a lot of the reception sorts of event management sorts of activities that she normally would do. So she took it upon herself to learn how to do web design because that was something that she wanted to do. So that was an example of, of um, her crafting her work to make it more stimulating. And if anyone is interested in that idea, um, on the website that I'll show you at the end or transformativeworkdesign.com website, um, I put together a series of blogs and videos during COVID um, that cover, the, and there was one on I'm bored, how to make your work more stimulating, and it just gives some ideas about that. Um, so there's things you can do as an individual. Um, of course, if you're a leader, there's also things that you can do if your workers, your employees were not being sufficiently stimulated. Um, and again, I don't have to, got time to go through all the suggestions, but one thing is, of course, trying to create some more meaningful projects, perhaps an opportunity to develop some, some new um, improved processes um, or perhaps an opportunity to, I don't know, explore the market or whatever, um, but um, deliberately taking some action to help um, people have stimulating, meaningful work whilst at home. I'm going to move now to mastery. And remember, mastery was about the importance of having clarity about what you're doing and getting feedback and understanding how your work contributes to the bigger picture. Actually, all of those issues um, were challenges for people, for some people during COVID, um, especially in the early days, people didn't know, you know, do I have to work at home nine to five? Can I be flexible? What are your expectations? Often people didn't know what they were. Um, often they didn't get any feedback from their managers. Um, and often they were also just over time sort of got a bit disconnected and not sort of remembering what was the sort of vision, what is the purpose of the work and so on. 
Uh, so you can see there the statistics um, from this data showed that about 40% of people were saying, I'm not getting enough feedback. And about 14% were saying, I'm not really clear on my goals and my objectives. And um, this, of course, is very stressful. And you saw in those earlier um, correlations that I showed you that low uh, mastery is associated with more distress. Um, it's also important from a feedback perspective. So uh, another um, um, way that we've analysed the data is to look and see if, you're, if you were getting feedback at time one, what happens over time? And we showed with these analyses that people who were getting feedback at time one experienced more clarity and less procrastination. So they were less likely to procrastinate um, because after all, it's quite hard sometimes to keep yourself motivated when you're working at home and getting feedback from the job. Um, so getting feedback from your clients or whatever actually helps you to be motivated. And then that was associated with feeling that they were performing um, more effectively at time three. And then we found that feedback from others, so getting feedback from your peers or from your supervisors was also associated with having more clarity and less procrastination and interestingly made you more adaptive um, three weeks later and that's important and, and in a sense feedback from others is probably a bit more challenging um, and, and probably sort of jolts you into changing the way that you do things. But the message here is the importance of um, making sure that if you're a leader that people have got clarity um, and feedback and understand where they are in the big picture, but also taking steps yourself as an individual to get that um, clarity. So just as one example, if you're a leader, one of the things you can do is, you know, build some feedback into your virtual meetings. I think there's a tendency for all of us, and I'm guilty of this myself, to sometimes think, you know, we'll give people feedback in the performance appraisal process. But there's absolutely no harm and, in fact, benefit, as shown by the previous slide, in giving people feedback all the time, regularly. So um, give people feedback and encourage people to give each other feedback if you are a leader. And, of course, if you are someone yourself and you are not sure and you are unclear, um, again, we have a tendency as human beings to wait until people choose to give us feedback. But there is absolutely no harm and a lot of benefit, actually, to proactively seek feedback. So just to say, you know, um, how am I doing? Can you give me some feedback? What am I doing well? What would you like to see me improve on? And actually soliciting that feedback. So what you can see here is that with these um, suggestions that I'm giving, I'm giving suggestions for leaders and I'm giving suggestions for workers. And this is important, right, because what we're really saying here is that good work design, good smart work design, effective management of psychosocial risks is a joint responsibility. It's the responsibility of individuals and it's the responsibility of their managers and leaders. It's also the responsibility of the organisation, um, but I, I won't talk about that at this moment. Let's go now to autonomy um, or, or agency. Um, if we just first of all go with pre-COVID, actually there was a lot of research showing that um, remote work or working from home has a lot of benefits for people. In fact, people tended to be more productive and have better well-being if they worked at home at least some of the time. Um, and the reason for that, these, this research shows, is because people have more autonomy and they're able to choose when they do things and, and how long they work or when they have their breaks and so on. Um, so that was pre-COVID research, but we found very similar findings here um, that if people, when they were working at home, felt they had autonomy, then that really helped them with their mental health. So you can see someone saying, even though I usually have autonomy, you know, during COVID, working from home, it feels greater because I can take breaks and use time completely as I see fit. And, you know, you can see here someone else talking about the flexibility to stay home when slightly unwell or tired, you know, um, 
or when my child is sick without feeling guilty about not going into the office. So maybe before you could work from home, but you, you might feel guilty. Um, and what you can see with these figures here, this is really just an enlarged version of what I showed you right at the beginning. If you have more decision-making autonomy when you're working from home, your burnout is less. Um, and you can see if you have scheduling autonomy, which means autonomy over when you do things, your, your burnout is less. If you have autonomy over how you'll do things, your burnout is less. And by the way, your satisfaction is higher, um, which is what you'd expect. But what's interesting also, you can see we also measured, did you feel when you were working from home that you were being closely monitored? So did you feel that your boss was expecting, um, checking up on you, making sure you're at your desk, et cetera? And did you feel what's called pressure to be available? So did you feel like you had to sort of, no matter what the time of the day, answer the emails or respond to the phone calls, et cetera? And we found that those, uh, which are both sort of low agency, you can see are associated with more burnout um, and less um, job satisfaction. Um, and I want to just delve a little bit more into this finding because it's very important. And what it shows is just because people are working at home, we can't assume that they have agency or autonomy um, because it's going to depend on how they are managed. So uh, one person said, for example, my manager tends to micromanage more with work from home arrangements, which can be demotivating and affect my morale and motivation. In one-on-one -on -one daily manager check-ins, there's a tendency to focus on what hasn't been done rather than what's been achieved. Um, and what you can see here from these statistics, uh, whoops, is that uh, we asked, you know, for example, do you feel that you were expected to re respond to electronic telephone messages immediately? You can see, um, you know, that quite a lot of people, um, if we add this up, it's about a third of people were saying, yes, quite often, actually, um, or very often. And that sort of creates then a pressure to just be available at all, even though you're working from home, a sort of pressure. Um, and uh, we actually wrote an article in Harvard Business Review, which we called Remote Managers Are Having Trust Issues, because we, we also uh, surveyed managers. And not surprisingly, given the fact that there was quite a lot of micromanagement happening, we found that about 24%, nearly one quarter of managers doubted the ability of the employees to do their work at home. And actually, interestingly, for many managers, the trust got worse over time, not better. So as people sort of showed um, that they were working, it didn't necessarily change managers' level of trust. In fact, maybe they got more worried over time. So that's one reason that managers can monitor people too closely and expect them to be available because they just don't trust um, their workers. If I go back to this uh, study that I showed you before where we tracked change over time, one of the drive, one of the predictors of being in this pattern, and that remember that this red group is people who started with high distress that got worse, um, was having this very high level of close monitoring. So having the boss who was, you know, constantly calling to check that you're at the desk or, you know, make sure you weren't still in bed or whatever. Um, and you can see there that I've, I've noted that this was especially, um, this, the, the workload, and I'll come to that a bit later, but the monitoring were especially stressful for people if you were someone who doesn't detach very well. And again, I'll talk a little bit about that later. So how do you increase your agency at home? Um, or as a leader, how do you increase um, agency? Well, you know, one of the things that we need to learn to do, and actually this is probably good practice management anyway, even if you're working in the office, is to try to manage people more by outputs and results rather than by than inputs. Um, and, you know, that does ultimately require trust. Um, and uh, so instead of monitoring where, you know, how much people are working, be looking more at um, the outputs of the work. Um, and as an individual, of course, um, one of the things that's important is if you do have agency at work, is to exercise that agency wisely, um, because this is 
this system rests on trust. And um, if, if you are someone who is struggling to motivate yourself, um, um, you, when you've got this more autonomy and so on, then um, actually one of the blogs I wrote, I haven't got it listed up there, is about how you can structure your time during the day and discipline yourself more and so on and, and make sure that you maintain your productivity um, throughout the day. Uh, and again, another blog there, um, tethered or trusted, there's no, ex the, 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 there's no excuse to not be at your desk phenomenon that we observed and how you might address that. Okay, uh, relational. This is, of course, a big one um, with working from home because many people did experience social isolation um, and a lack of support. Um, another relational challenge when working from home was also how do you as a team coordinate? Because often a lot of the coordination just happens, you know, by virtue of bumping into each other. How do you coordinate as a virtual team? Um, when you are not seeing each other face to face. And I think I've already mentioned another aspect was sometimes people losing this sense that they're making a difference to other people's lives. So here's an example, you know, working from home can be rather lo lonely. I miss helping people with advice and support. I miss laughing and hearing stories about dogs and kids. As an introvert, this has been the most surprising aspect of working from home. So um, people sometimes think that introverts, introverts don't need people. Introverts need people just as much as extroverts. They just like to interact with them sometimes in a different way. And here's an example of that coordination challenge. You know, our team is definitely less of a team right now. Um, the times when you might just pull someone in for their opinion, that doesn't matter nearly as much anymore. So I can imagine over time strategic vision or direction would fall by the wayside. And what we, we showed, again, seeing these statistics here, that if you were someone that had beneficiary contact, which means you, are, if you feel that you're connecting with the people who benefit from the work, the end users, if you felt you had good support from your colleagues and managerial support and a sense of value in your work, you know, you're less likely to be burnt out and more likely to be satisfied and also to perform um, more effectively. We also did a study actually very early in the pandemic um, um, in China, looking because pre-pandemic China had very low levels of working from home. And in, in that context, we found that social support from your colleagues or from your boss was really important in reducing loneliness, in reducing the amount of procrastination you were engaging in, in helping you to manage homework issues, and also in terms of um, shaping your communication. And all these things were important drivers of mental health and performance. And this, so this goes to a point Chris made when he introduced um, the, the conversation that the support that you get from people really can make a difference to your work design experiences um, and your mental health. So no matter what um, challenges you're in, support is one of the most, most powerful vehicles. So as a leader, all sorts of things, of course, you can do. And I think during COVID, everybody learned about the importance of, of check-ins and, and, and helping to support water cooler conversations virtually and so on. But one thing I think was also important um, which perhaps was less commonly done, was just to remind people of the purpose and the value of their work and its impact on others. Because, because you're isolated, you can, lose, um, you can lose that fact and you can forget. And I personally suffered a bit from that. And it was important, you know, to remind each other, this is what we're really trying to do here and this is why it matters. Um, as an individual, um, again, lots of things that you can do. Um, one of the blogs um, and videos that I created was about this idea of building high quality connections. And again, I don't have time to talk through that now, but um, that video and blog um, there talks about um, how high quality connections, um, you know, involve genuine listening. They involve genuine perspective taking of the other person and they involve actually um, you, you being willing to help 
that other person. If you genuinely listen to someone, um, you can often find ways to help them that are meaningful. So that blog is all about um, building high quality connections, not just lots of connections, but high quality connections. T is the big one, of course, um, and you can see that we measured people's workload, we measured their work family conflict, which is obviously how much your work and your family are causing conflict with each other. Home interference is similar. We measured whether you felt you were experiencing emotional demands, whether you were having problems with communication, often just technical issues, and also other technological hassles. And you can see with those large um, dark shadings of the link with burnout, that high workload, high work um, conflict, work home interference, emotional demands, poor communication, these were strong correlates of, um, of burnout and, and mental ill health um, during COVID. And you can see, you know, here's a quote, someone saying it's hard to differentiate work and home space. So work seeps into non-work time and spaces. It's harder to shut down. Um, there can be less distinction between work and personal life when I work from home. Um, and so we actually measured people's um, time saved commuting. And then we asked them, what did you do with that time that you saved? And many people said, well, we worked. You know, so... Um, one of the things that was happening actually in COVID, you know, we, we talked about some people had not enough to do and underload and how that was stressful, but also people sometimes just kept working more and more and more um, because they didn't have that clear demarcation between work and home. Um, and that time that they saved with, you know, uh, commuting, they just poured into work. And so people we saw um, with emerging burnout. Also, of course, people were coping with, um, you know, just the children at home sometimes, um, uh, extra workload because a lot of organisations had to rapidly change how they were doing things and, and so on. Um, so again, coming back to that longitudinal study, work overload was one of the main drivers of being in that group where your distress got worse over time. This is not just correlations, it is, there is some rigor here and again especially this was especially true if you were someone who was not good at detaching from work so a lot of research showing the benefit of actually stopping work and thinking about it and doing other things so what can you do to make um, your own work more tolerable or others one of the things is if you're a leader um, there's all sorts of things you can do, and I've put them there. You can observe your workers for stress, and you can educate workers about stress and so on. You can try to reduce their demands. But what you can also do is increase the extent to which they feel their work is stimulating, clear, and they've got feedback, and they've got agency, and they're supported. So increasing the SMART aspects that I've talked about, actually research shows can help make high workloads and things much more tolerable. Um, again, lots of blogs I did on this topic about self-compassion, um, about switching off, how to recover. I mentioned that detachment is important um, and there's some research around and I'm happy to take questions on this around what sorts of detachment um, more important. There are some forms that are more important than others. And I also did a, a, a blog on this thing of being a Zoom zombie. Um, and if you've got those back-to-back -back Zoom meetings or Teams meetings or whatever you're using, um, why that can get so exhausting and what you can do to, to manage that. Um, so plenty that you can do. So I want to start wrapping up and talking a little bit about the future in the in the last five minutes. So um, I started asking um, at the beginning, is this elevated level of psychological distress that we observed during COVID, is that just um, due to things like pandemic uncertainty and worry about catching um, the, the illness, etc.? cetera? Um, well, I hope that I've persuaded you that no, some of it is about the quality of your work. And similarly, I asked, what about productivity? Is that just because your work is unsuitable? And no, it is also about things like your workload, um, the support that you get um, from your boss and so on. So what I've really tried to argue here 
that if you have smart work design when you're working from home, so stimulating work with mastery, with agency, where you've got support and relational and you're part of a team and demands that are tolerable, then that is protective against your mental health or your workers' mental health and um, lowered productivity. And what I've suggested is that where does smart work design come from? Where's the magic? Well, the magic is in what you do as an employee and what you do as a leader. And also I have to say what organisations do, but I haven't talked about that um, just for the moment. So the first key message that I wanted to convey today is that people's mental health and wellbeing and their work performance is affected by the quality of their work design. And I've introduced that smart work model to help you understand what good quality work design is like. Um, so that's good news because that's something we can um, do something about. So what about the future? What's going to happen? Um, and we have seen all sorts of um, just projections about this where some people, you know, here's an article, for example, of 30 companies who are saying that they're going to have permanent remote work now post-COVID. And we've also seen other articles where people are being told you must get back to the office because, I don't know, the city, the city is suffering and you're a public servant, you've got to get back in and be in the office. So we've seen different extremes. We've seen sort of throw out the uh, office altogether and also throw out the, the home working. So will working from home at least some of the time become the new normal and do we want it to? Um, well, from our um, survey, we found that 73% um, of people are keen in the future to work from home at least some of the time. And also, people have got more skill to do that. So you can see I'm more confident that I can do my job effectively working from home than I was before COVID. I've developed technical skills and so on. So people feel more confident about working from home and they're keen to do so. And there's a lot of talk about the great resignation happening in the US and so on, saying, well, if people can't get it, they're going to resign or they are resigning. Um, so there's quite some um, pressure on organisations to um, find ways to um, allow people to work from home at least some of the time. So which baby should we throw out? Well, if we throw out the remote work baby and, and insist everyone must come back into the office, we will lose those benefits of the greater agency that people have. And I mentioned before that pre-COVID, um, um, the research showed a meta-analysis of 46 studies showed that um, working from home at least some of the time was positive overall for work club, family conflict, for job satisfaction, for performance because of that greater agency. So we don't really want to throw out the remote work baby um, because there's some real benefits in people having more autonomy um, to choose where they work and, and how they have their breaks and exactly when they work and so on. But we also don't necessarily want to throw out the office baby because, again, there is some research about the benefits of physically coming together um, around informal interactions, community and connection, and many of us know that, right, from our own experience and, and the desire to get back in the office. Um, and, of course, some groups in particular can miss out um, if everything is, is remote. One of the things that can happen, and there's some research on this, is that you, you need to get, especially when people are going back into the office um, for the first time after COVID, is the problem is that if not many people go back in the office, People who come into the office to um, connect with others will then go, oh, well, there's no one here, so I'm not going to bother. So, um, you know, as, as these researchers said, if the office is just a collection of employees not working together, it's essentially no different from a coffee shop, though perhaps with better internet and worse coffee. So we do need to think about what sort of offices people are coming back to, what sort of work people are coming back to. And if people are coming back to work for those informal interactions and community and connection, then do we need to change the way we're doing things um, to cultivate that some more? And so ultimately, in the end, I think we're going to see 
much more hybrid working. And we're going to have to figure out ways of getting that right balance. And I think there's three R's um, for leaders that we need to think about. We need to reflect, first of all, what can be learned from working at home during the pandemic? Which tasks could be done at home? Which can't? Who thrives? Who doesn't? Not everyone loves to be at home. Some people do love to be at home. What have been the positive surprises? What have been the downsides? What innovations have emerged? And, you know, is this an opportunity to really rethink how things are done? The second R is reorient. And this was my second key message. I think that we do need to move away from just saying, can people work flexibly or not? To saying, yes, you know, really, we, you know, most people, um, task contingent, of course, depends on your work. Some work can't be done at home. But if it can be done at home, you know, supporting flexible working, but talking more about how do we ensure that that work is smart, whether it's remote or whether it's in the office. So we need to move away from shifting our focus just on a policy. A policy is not enough. We really need to look at those everyday practices, leadership practices and individual practices that I've been talking about um, to make sure that we can um, get this hybrid working um, actually working. Um, and I, I, I won't go through all that detail there because I really do want to have some questions. And then I think the third R is research. Actually, we don't really know what's best yet, right? And we're still struggling to figure out how do we handle hybrid meetings? You know, if there's eight people in the office and two people at home, you know, what do we do? Do we struggle on with our meeting with can't hear the people in the in the, at home or do we all go back to our offices? And if we do that, what about those eight people that are there and would like to talk to each other, et cetera? Big, big challenges there. So we've got to experiment. We've got to try and we've got to then evaluate what, what is working and what's best. And again, a couple of blogs on that. So my second key message, and I'm close to finishing now, is that we really need to shift away from saying, should we have flexible working or not, to how do we design, how do we create that quality work, that smart work, when we're remote, working from home, and when we're in the office. We have actually developed lots of resources that are freely available to you on our website. Um, one is geared towards individuals, how to make my flexible work smart. One is geared towards managing teams and one is geared towards leadership. And these draw on um, evidence and also practice. Uh, and you are welcome to download those. So at this point, I would just love to say thank you so much for listening. Um, I, I can't see the chat, so I don't know if you have questions, but uh, looking forward to um, sharing with um, answering some of those questions. The good news, Sharon, is I have all the questions in hand. The bad news yeah. is you're at my mercy. So uh, <laughs> here we go. Um, oh, dear. <laughs> thank you for your presentation. Really enjoyed it. Um, earlier on, Carolyn asked, what was the question relating to autonomy of method, please? OK, so autonomy of methods. And we usually, with all of these things, we ask three or four questions because we don't want to leave anything to chance. Um, but it's about do you have... Um, do you have some autonomy, some agency over how you do your work? So the methods that you use, the processes that you use and so on. Um, so that's what that concept is about. Um, and it's about as much as possible trying to give people autonomy over methods. So what we talk about is um, it's really important that people clear about the end goal, what it is they're trying to achieve, and then trying to give people a little bit of latitude, a little bit of autonomy, a bit of agency about how they get to that end goal. Um, so that's what that concept is about. Okay, thank you for that. Michelle asks, how do you stop Zoom fatigue? I think it's something that we're all going to suffer from. Uh, you know, replaced, replacing one-on-one -on -one meetings and gatherings with staring down the screen and not knowing who's at the other end and what's going on. Yeah, uh, yeah, there are a number of factors that can um, enhance Zoom fatigue and they can be things like just the fact that of normally when you're physically in the office, you'd get up and walk to another meeting or you would have somebody can see that you're in another meeting so they know that you're busy. Um, and so, you know, they'll give you a little break before your next meeting. Of course, with Zoom, we don't necessarily have those things. And so we often end up in this back-to-back -back Zoom meetings. 
Um, so doing things like, you know, making sure everyone understands you might be five minutes late to the meeting um, or, or, of course, scheduling a five-minute break if you can between meetings. Um, sometimes that doesn't happen, of course. Um, I know one team, for example, just have an implicit agreement that for those first five minutes of a meeting, um, they'll just chat and no one minds if people come in late because they know that this is sometimes what happens. Um, but another thing that's important is to recognise that some of the fatigue that comes from Zoom meetings is the fact that even though Zoom is great, you know, you can see people, um, it still requires more mental resources than talking with someone face to face because you don't get perfect um, you don't get, you know, you don't, can't see people when they're not on the screen um, and you're having to make a lot more guesses about people's emotional states. It's, it's more mentally demanding to try and figure out um, emotional cues and things like that when you're on Zoom than when you're face to face. So for that reason, I actually recommend in that blog, you know, sometimes turn off your camera, actually, just go to audio. That's, that actually can really help um, with Zoom fatigue because you're not having to be on stage um, because in some sense when you're on the camera, you're on stage and you, 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 that takes emotional resources. So step off the stage, turn off your camera sometimes. Um, don't do your emails, of course, at the same time. So that's not going to help. Um, but, you know, just reduce that load on you a little bit. And there are other tips in the blog um, that you can check out. Sharon, as we head into the closing minutes of your presentation, Helen asks, and if you do have a question, please get to the chat box ASAP and we'll try to get to them as soon as we can uh, in the time that we have left. Uh, Helen asks, uh, do you think connection will come back? Uh, you know, I think uh, a lot of us are feeling a bit disconnected, a bit isolated at times, but will we get that uh, connection back? I guess it depends a little bit on some of those factors that I've been talking about. Um, what, what, how do we create that community back in the office? You know, um, so I think one of the dangers is that, yeah, because people have now adapted to working from home and got quite used to it, you know, it's sometimes challenging for people to then want to come into the office. And then, of course, um, they make the effort and they come in and there's no one here, there's nothing happening. Um, one of the blogs that I did was about the four Fs of um, return, facilitating return. And, you know, one of them was fun, actually. And, you know, maybe just having a bit more attention to going to lunch together or setting up some informal opportunities to interact if they're not naturally happening. So, so we might need to be proactive um, as, as leaders and as, as organisations in building the connection. And we might also need to be proactive ourselves because, yeah, you can get a bit complacent and, and a bit sort of out of the habit. Of, so some people, you know, have gone that way and they're sort of, lost you know forgotten how to connect with people and it's just easier not to and it's easier just to go online or whatever those people are going to you know maybe watch that high quality connection blog other people of course are desperate to connect and can't wait um, but yeah I think my overarching message is we you know we might need to just give it some attention recognizing that it requires learning learning almost some new routines again um, so thanks for that question that was great yeah and You've touched on all um, issues about connection and that probably leads us into this question. Have you got tips on how to encourage or approach someone who doesn't want to come back at all, even, say, one day a week, uh, whether they're scared, uh, they're timid, lost confidence, whatever the issue is, they just don't want to come back to work? Yeah, good question. And, again, I, I think the, the blog that I did on the four Fs, you know, we talk about... Fear, fun, I've forgotten the other two now. <laughs> so I'll have to look. Flexibility. And flexibility is about recognising that people will have different needs at the moment. Some will be very anxious about, um, you know, catching um, COVID um, on the bus or whatever. So I think just trying to be flexible um, to begin with and, and allow people, recognising that people might have genuine fears. I think probably trying to understand that person's motivation. Yeah, is it worry? Is it fear of COVID? 
is it um, just, you know, that, that, that they've got into the habit of being at home? I know that when we transitioned back to the work um, after, you know, multiple months, um, it took me some time to get a new habit of coming in because you just, you know, it's great to get up in the morning and not have to, you know, not have to get properly dressed and do your ironing and all that sort of thing. Um, and honestly, I would say it took me at least three weeks to just get back into the routine. And then I was just as happy coming into work. So, you know, it might be again that, you know, people need to ease into it. In the end, you know, the work needs to be done. And so, it is about people recognising that you don't have complete autonomy to just decide exactly what you want to do. Um, in the, it's about a balanced level of autonomy, but in the context of meeting your work goals. So if you need to come into work, um, to work, and that includes interacting with other people and stuff, then you as a leader, you know, have the, the right to have those conversations. But just being flexible um, and um, taking that person's perspective around, you know, what might be some of the blocks and seeing if you can problem solve and help them to, um, you know, work out a pathway to, to, to do that. Thank you, Sharon. Uh, Carolyn asks, in the smart model, um, where would process, tech and governance issues come into the impacts on people's well-being, such as lack of responsiveness of leaders or poor governance, highly manual processes that are outdated? I guess that I guess I didn't really talk today about what organisations need to be doing from a smart work design perspective, and that was really just um, partly because of the time constraints of today's talk. But in a sense, um, good smart work design is a sort of tripartite responsibility almost between the organisation and those bigger policies and processes and technologies. Um, and then the leader and then the individual. Um, and it's not, um, sometimes leaders can't influence those bigger things. And I think some of those were mentioned in that question. You know, the, the processes, for example, might need radically overhauling, but those processes might be deeply embedded into the technologies. And that might not be something that the leader can change. It might only be something that can be changed by, you know, at an organisational level or with the with senior leadership getting involved. So, look, I think there's no easy answer to that question, but recognising that smart work design is influenced by those um, bigger elements as well. And, and, and sometimes to get smart work design, you have to change those those things too. And that's harder. That's actually more challenging. That's that's a topic for another presentation. Nice. <laughs> yeah, it's a very good question. Um, and I do talk about that a lot, but it's a big topic because it means really understanding the systems and the processes that are driving the work and then shifting them. And that that's we're talking power, you know, we're talking all sorts of big, big topics there. We'll hold you to that maybe for another session. Um, lastly, to finish up, uh, Arlene says thanks and uh, lots to think about and discuss. And Kerry shares with us uh, that she developed a chronic health condition last year. If it weren't for work from home, she would have uh, had to give up work or reduce days. Work from home has made it possible for her to work. So it's really, really important, Sharon. I can I completely agree, and that's why I'm saying we don't want to throw that baby out of the of the bath. You know, when we move forward, there's enormous benefits to be gained from working home. There are challenges too, and I've covered some of those, but there are benefits, and we do not and 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 increasing accessibility to people with chronic health conditions or disabilities. Um, is one of those very important benefits. So we do not want to throw that baby out. Thank you. Professor Sharon Parker, time is of the essence. Thank you for sharing your presentation and your wisdom in the Q&A session today. Thank you so much, Chris. It's been my pleasure. All right. And thank you to everyone for joining us today for our third Safe Work Month online series event. We hope you have learnt a lot from these events and are able to share your learnings with your colleagues. I want to remind you that today's presentation recording will be available through the portal. Keep an eye out for it in the next week or so. 
We have our very last short talk with Naomi Armitage next week. She will be looking at how fostering a culture of health and safety is no longer seen as nice to have, but a necessity and foundation for the overall performance of a business. Make sure you sign up for that. To keep the Safe Work Month momentum going, why not visit worksafe.qld.gov.au to access a full range of industry and topic-specific video case studies, podcasts, speaker recordings and webinars and films to help you take action to improve your WHS and return to work outcomes. These resources are free to download and share, so I encourage you to share them with your staff and, of course, your networks. Have a good day, everyone. Remember, work safe, home safe. We leave you now with a word from our event sponsor, No More Pain Ergonomics. Are you looking for the best ergonomic office equipment for you and your staff? Change the way you work with No More Pain Ergonomics. We stock a complete range of affordable ergonomic office equipment, including furniture, mice, keyboards, and more. Our team of health professionals hand select products to solve your aches and pains. Then, with our 30-day guarantee, if the product doesn't help, simply exchange or return it for a refund. View our full range at nomorepainergonomics.com.au.